Hello, everyone. So you already, I was already presented to you. My name is Alexey Vasilyev. So my talk about serverless and use cases for web project. How you can use it, how it can help you, or maybe you shouldn't use it for some cases. So yeah, it's a little informa information about me. Mostly I'm a web and mobile developer, doing some DevOps, have some open source libraries, open source books, uh, leading a report podcast, it's mostly about Ruby and JavaScript world. So now let's go to serverless. So what is serverless? Serverless, it's computing in the cloud where model provides you like server dynamically. You don't uh, set up this server. You do nothing. It's like function as a service. So you just put your code and it just invoke, call, by HTTP or some other stuff. Like in these cases, many developers like serverless because devs like to write code, not to manage resources, servers, anything else, and no need to deal with ops part. Like many person doesn't like this ops part and want to be only developer. That's why serverless right now starting, uh, start to grow. Right now, many companies start to uh, moving to serverless, but of course you can move only part of the resources, not everything, everything, but still it's very interesting technology. Right now we have many serverless solutions, like mostly in cloud providers, like AWS Lambda, Azure Serverless, Google Cloud Functions, Apache OpenRigs, uh, Kubeless, and many, many others. So what about Ruby? Like because be talking on this conference about Ruby also. So if you look, right now AWS Lambda support Ruby, so you can already write your little functions on the Ruby and just run them on AWS Lambda. Azure Serverless not supported by default. They have protocol which you can extend and maybe try to run Ruby inside this protocol. It's used some uh, stuff, but mostly by default it doesn't support this. Google Cloud Function also nope, it doesn't support. Uh, Ruby right now, and Apache Open Risk, yeah, it supports this. So right now, mostly I will focus on AWS because right now AWS like biggest uh, company which uh, growing and improving serverless very really quickly. It have many many features which you can use right now. But if you want to write code which will run mostly on any serverless platform with some little changes, I think right now is best language for you is JavaScript, because almost everyone, every platform support JavaScript or maybe TypeScript, like as you wish. So let's go to our use cases about serverless. Uh, most simple and popular use cases, it's resize image on S3 buckets. Like you have some uploader, you upload image, and you want to resize this image with some thumbnails. And even with serverless, with AWS, you have several ways to do this. Like you can use AWS S3 events, AWS AP Gateway, or even AWS Lambda Edge. So let's check how it works. So with AWS S3 events, it's very simple. Like you have your website or something like this, it's upload image. Image uploaded on S3, AWS S3, S3 trigger event, and this event automatically trigger Lambda function. Lambda function get this image, resize it, and upload into the same bucket, or maybe in different buckets, so you can, after this, serve this. So how it looks like, very simple, you have some gem file with AWS SDK and Minimagic for resizing. Next, very simple function which image handler process, which will handle our events, and on these events we will resize images. And of course, of course not all the code, because code very like not so small. We just show partially like how it use Minimagic, open the picture which downloaded from AWS S3 source, and also how it's back uploaded here. So this is one way how to deal with this. It's very simple way, straightforward, because in these cases, any image which you upload in S3 automatically will get resized version of your images. Uh, but maybe sometimes you don't need this. You need some maybe lazy evaluation, like you upload image, but you want maybe resized image only on request. 
like maybe you have some part of websites which asking about resized image and you thinking, okay, on the, in this case, let's create resized version. In this case, you can use something like AWS uh, AP Gateway. It's one of the way to work with, by HTTP with Lambda. Also, you can connect to this stuff uh, application load balancer. It's also the way. But be careful with Amazon IP Gateway. It's very interesting stuff. It's powerful. Like you can route different requests to different services, like to EC2, DynamoDB, Kinesis, and even Lambda. But pricing for this uh, service is pretty high, as I think because later you will see like how it's growing for your requests. Uh, so I, uh, AWS IP Gateway works very simple. You have your CloudFront, for example, for your images. Uh, when for some roads it triggers Amazon IP Gateway, Gateway go to Lambda, and Lambda automatically do resizing, saving image, and serve this image to your client. So in these cases, this is how can be looks like your URL schema. Like if you want to resize, you provide some like, I need this type, maybe slash crop, maybe thumbnail, maybe something else. Like you can create any schema what you want, then point this schema to uh, your AWS gateway, say it like gateway should provide all this schema as parameters, and after this your function on Ruby will do resizing and saving this image. Again, it's very interesting approach, but be careful with uh, IP Gateway. The uh, next one, also very interesting stuff, it's AWS Lambda Edge. So I think everybody know like what is CloudFront, it's CDN on AWS, and most of CDN is for static stuff. Like you have, st uh, like for example, our website is just static website. We don't have any dynamic stuff on this website. Because it's safe, secure, you cannot hack it because it's just static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So, but sometimes you want to do some dynamic stuff with this uh, website, like some middleware. And AWS Lambda Edge allows to do this. You can create special Lambda function, which will work like middleware between your request or response of user and static content. Exist several types like view request, origin request, origin response, and view response. The main difference is that if you modify or do something in origin where not distributed cache exists, this response will be cached and your AWS Lambda stuff will not recall again because it will be reused cached information. So you also can save on requests. So this is how it works, for example, again about resizing. You, like your user call from CloudFront service, like give me please this image, these formats. Your function check like, oh, on S3, no this, no this image, like zero. So let's create this image, respond to this image, and also store this image on S3. In these cases, this flow can work. Also like lazy evaluation, but of course in these cases you need to use CloudFront directly. Like your assets should be distributed by CloudFront. So this is our use case. For example, this is our official website. Like I think everybody knows like CloudFront allow you to specify the default root object, like index HTML. So if you have like slash, it's automatically go and serve index HTML. But this doesn't work with subdirectories, like this stuff. It will not work. So how to deal with this? Of course, like if you have some like this website.com, it works. But if you have something like this, so it will not work on CloudFront. Before this, we use Nginx, which directly like rewrite this URL and go directly to S3 and serve this content. But it was like waste of time, resources. Also, we need to set up and work with this Nginx server. So we decided to move to CloudFront. And here a part of this function is, of course, JavaScript right now here where we serve this request, check if this request have this slash in the end, and if it have, we add this index HTML, and of course call callback. Callback is exactly here, because it's asynchronous function. Uh, if somebody try to add index HTML, you can try this right now, it automatically will do redirection. Like, as you can see in this example, it will do redirection, because 
SEO guys will say like, if you serve the same content on different URLs, it's not very good. So you should also resolve these problems. And this is exactly how it works. And also sometimes, sometimes, some people, when doing website, forgot to add backslash. Like it's also problems, and that's why it also solve this problem. Like if somebody forgot this, we have this also redirect with, of course, added backslash. This is how it works. Very simple. And if nothing much, of course, we just serve this request with callback. That's all. So this is how one of the example how we use this lambda edge. So how it can help you? Like you can improve security and privacy of your website because you can modify headers response headers for your website, like content security headers, feature policy, everything else. You can also do some SEO optimization in between, like directly, for example, you understand this robot or not robot, or maybe you should add additional content. Bot mitigation, for example, you have your website, static website, and you want to disable these bots to go into your website and doing, I don't know, something bad. In these cases, you can also add this. Real-time image transformation, A-B testing, for example, you want to spare your traffic on different users and check your new landing and old landing, how it works, and many, many other stuff. For example, user tracking and analysis, because you can trigger some DynamoDB or Kinesis and store some information about user, and in these cases, like track what's going on. Our next use case, it's very interesting, because like, we have uh, several domains which we use in our labs. It's a separate like, uh, group of people which do some research, uh, testing, or something else. And we have special domains, like domains uh, which used uh, for different testing, for some websites, workers, everything else. And some, of course, in many times, we need certificate for HTTPS. Uh, because we have one domain and mostly use third level domain, we cannot like on each domain, on each server setup, again, certificate, let's encrypt, cron task, and everything else. We want to have centralized storage, which will generate wildcard certificate only in one place, and we will distribute the certificate on any service that we need. In these cases, oh, so sorry. So, yes. Uh, in this case, we use also Lambda. It's a very simple approach. Like, you have your code, which have access to S3 bucket, and also have access to road 53, because you have several ways to approve your Let's Encrypt certificate, but for wildcard, you need to use DNS records. In these cases, we have two open source. For first one, ECME AWS Lambda, it's Ruby. So don't worry, it's just Ruby, uh, which you can add, run, and it will generate you or renew certificate. Second one, used to fetch this certificate. So this is how it looks like. You have this, of course, because it's Ruby, we have DSL, which provide like, this is your contact email, because uh, let's encrypt need contact email. Your domains, maybe wildcard domains and everything else. S3 bucket, S3 certificate key, road 53 domain, where exactly to update these records. And after this, you create this handle function, which will create or renew certificate, like this. So how it looks like? This is very simple. You have this CloudWatch events, which will trigger our function. And this is access to our function. So you need a Amazon Road 53, Amazon S3. And here, uh, CloudWatch events, it uses this cron task, so we run this Lambda function automatically by AWS once per day. So each day this function runs, and of course it's check, like this is how it looks like. So as you can see, Ruby consumes not so much memory, also speed, like okay. Maybe not so speed if some in other languages, but still. And as you can see, it just runs and says your certificate is still valid. Exiting like how this looks like in our servers. Oh yes, of course. And next, we have this S3 fetch certification binary. It's written in Go. 
yeah, sorry, not on Ruby, because uh, Go have this binary stuff, it's very simple to distribute on different machines. And we just provide this crontab job, which also checking uh, by head request if certificate changed, and if certificate changed, it automatically updates the certificates, and also have this useful command, uh, run after change, which you can run different commands, like for example, reload Apache or reload Nginx, or whatever you use for uh, serve your HTTPS. So this is how it looks like our monitoring stuff, because I hope everybody monitor also certificates, like how they expire, have these triggers about expirations. And this is how you can see uh, going on. It's days left until expire. As you can see, it's go down. And then it's like go to 30 days. This script automatically lambda function renew and create new certificate as three fetch automatically get new certificates and you go back here. And this continue again um, somebody like two months and then you go back again for this new pick. This is how it looks like in our case, use case for SSL monitoring. So next one is about security. We also has another open source stuff called Certainit. It's serverless SSA certificate authority because right now we're moving to stop using for SSH keys like this simple um, SSH keys between teams because very big problems like how to rotate keys if somebody go away from your company or how you add some, somebody new to your servers. Like you should have some system or I don't know like maybe you pay for some service which do this. For example, of course, many uh, people which I ask, they mostly use, Her uh, use Heroku and they nobody care about SSH. But if you want to go by SSH, it's like little tricky what to do. And in these cases, we have this little stuff which can generate certificates. What about good about these certificates? It's already used in Facebook, Uber, Netflix, uh, Google, Lyft. Uh, it provides you some mechanism with no TOFU. TOFU means like trust on first use. I think everybody remember this stuff when you first reconnect to any SSH and your SSH client said, oh, this is signature, do you accept or no, yes. And I think everybody always type yes. Uh, but it's like one of the security mechanism. And by using certificate, you can provide special certificates on all your servers. And in these cases, if you not see this screen, it's okay. But if you start seeing this screen, looks like somebody between your server or another stuff because this certificate provides you trust connection. Also, it can be integrated with SSO and multi-factor notification. Good stuff about this is after expiring. So certificates, you can provide them time to leave. Like this certificate can leave only 10 minutes or one day. So if somebody like go away from your company, you know like, his certificate will work only one day. On the next day, you like close access to renew his certificates, and that's all. Like you save nothing. Uh, he cannot generate new ones, so he cannot go into new servers. So certain is again two parts. First one is serverless, which exactly working and generate certificates, and second one is command line utility, which mostly used to generate like and for encryption, gen cert, we generate uh, certificate itself. Of course, for security reason, we use uh, passwords for your private keys. Private uh, passwords also encrypted into some keys. You can use symmetric encryption. You can use AWS KMS encryptions. So different approaches you can use to even more secure your information. Yes, this is how it looks like, and. Yeah, let's go to major pros and cons about serverless. So pros, it's pricing because in all our cases, sometimes we even fit into free tire. Like if we need to renew certificate for SSH, it's very, not SSH, SSL, it's very like we need this in the months, 30, 31 runs and that's all. Like Amazon even will not count this. Like, okay, it's for free. Uh, also reduce maintenance, like because in these cases I no need to care about what's going on, like should I renew some 
libc or open ssl on my servers what's going on maybe i need to rebuild my nginx because it also outdated scalability of course it's very simple i think everybody like this stuff like on heroku you just pull down your stuff and that's all the same here like you can scale as much money you have uh, fast delivery because mostly it's very simple you like pack this into zip file upload and that's all or even use the serverless frameworks which automatically will do you like just write schema in yaml and that's all and security like mostly you don't care about security of these machines but of course you need to care about security of your code application is still here problems so first of all it's vendor operated environment like amazon even several times change its environment and some of our lambda functions like python functions stop working and we still start to rebuild this function so it works or for example one day decided to to make some like this file system only read only in some of your again functions stop working because it's tried to write something on file system uh, limits and cost alterations like in the next slide, I will show you like it's not very simple to work with serverless if you want to build, for example, API on this on serverless because it will be costly. Security, of course, it's also problems because um, sometimes like you forgot, uh, like you not think about security of servers itself, but still you need to think about how you will securely run on Lambda, how you will access your resources how you will access to, like, go to internet and use some other resources. Also, the problem is cold start, because if your Lambda function doesn't run maybe one day or something like this, in these cases, it will take more time while it run. After this, it will be faster. Uh, some people use something called ping stuff. It's, they write these CloudWatch events and ping this function each five minutes, but I think it's not a very good approach. Like, if you need to ping to perform your Lambda function, maybe better to create server, not to use for this serverless. Not efficient for long line up, uh, for not efficient for long running applications. It's just because you pay for memory, you pay for time, so as longer your function works, as longer you consume more memory, it's like not cost efficient. Performance, yes. So functions with less memory have slower CPU speed. Like if you want to calculate something and you understand like you need less memory, sometimes you still need to provide more memory for this serverless function because you need bigger CPU. Like right now, serverless just have these memory limits, but you cannot say like, okay, let's small amount of memory, but I need eight CPUs. It's not possible. If you need bigger CPU, you need to provide bigger memory. And of course, you will pay for this memory if you even not consume this amount of memory. And of course, very tricky to test this functionality. Like, for example, you write your code and you want to test this locally without AWS, Google Cloud Function, and something like this. And some of these, uh, like for example, Google, they provide some framework to test your function lock. Uh, on local environment. But for example, AWS said like upload and check and that's all. And this is not very good because like if you use a test driven approach, in most cases it's going to like mock every interface and just check that your interface worked with mocked interface and that's all. So about server cost. Like it's separate problem with serverless because Imagine you have your API, which, for example, handle, I don't know, one million requests per day. Not a huge amount, I think. But if you will connect to this AWS Lambda or, and also add, for example, AP Gateway to serve all this stuff, in this case, it can cost you, I think, $2,000 per month. Like, it's not very cheap. Of course, mostly this pricing will be AP Gateway, but Lambda also can cost, like, so big amount of money, so cheaper for you to use some real server or virtual server, but not serverless. Serverless is better for some like controlled amount of tasks, like some workers, some maybe requests which generate exactly you, not your customer. Because if customer generate this request, like some customer can create like this DDoS stuff, and in these cases you will pay for each request. And of course it's not very good stuff for everyone. 
So yeah, this is how it looks like in some our AWS accounts, Lambda. This is how much we pay for uh, Lambda with uh, uh, our static website. We search on it, on it, like we provide several Lambdas in one account. And as you can see, like for CloudFront, we pay, pay much more than for Lambda, like CloudFront, which serve us as CDN for all these assets. Like Lambda here is very small amount of money. Like, so of course, but you need to check all this information, like how high load your request workers. Like my previous example about resizing images, I think it doesn't scale if you build in something like uh, Google Photos. Because in these cases, it like will be like, you threw the money to Amazon because it's too much. Cheaper for you will be run separate servers with bigger amount of CPU with some workers which do this work. So my little tips when you're working with Lambda. Fun uh, so Lambda functions is completely isolated from public inter internet. You should understand this. You can do in one way, for example, you can run Lambda which have access to public internet, but in these cases, it doesn't have access to your RDS, DynamoDB, anything inside your VPC. But if you want to use these resources, in these cases, it will not will have access to some outside world. It's like security approach from AWS, and you should always be prepared for this, because sometimes our developers try to write function which go so somewhere, develop something, then put this into our database, and of course, it doesn't work. Of course, you can, cre you can create two VPC, and then one should be public, another private, then create not between them, but it's like separate work which you should do. Uh, next one is execution lambda from another lambda is very slow. Like if it's possible, you can try this, it works. Like one lambda can trigger another lambda, like you can create something like three, but it's like not very effective by speed. So use this only if speed doesn't matter. Uh, of course, very interesting stuff, you should optimize your code always for your language. Like, in this place, you pay for time and memory. And if you write not effective code, like, it will, you will pay for this. So better, in this case, I thinking about your code, maybe use less libraries if it's possible, or zero, it's like perfect approach, like zero libraries. But always thinking how to optimize this, if JavaScript maybe use this precompiler with sub optimizations for Ruby, like not use something old library, not old but slow libraries, maybe some C wrappers which can works. Always deploy V torrent code like independence. I think most of DevOps should know this stuff because they not guarantee like your Lambda function will be not called maybe several times. And if you have something like I don't know, you have your billing system inside Lambda, it's not a good approach, but imagine. In these cases, you can build some customers several times. So please don't do this, or use it at least independence code, like if it's run, it run only once with the same arguments, and that's all. It's on another run, it will do nothing. Uh, use that letter queues. It's like, with Lambda, the main problem, if something goes wrong, uh, Lambda will just rerun, and that's all. Like, your code fail, it rerun. Your code fail, it rerun, and that's all. And sometimes you no need to rerun. You need, like, understand, okay, it's maybe it's invalid data, and you can use some separate approaches, like dead queues. You put your invalid information in separate queue, and maybe later, some another Lambda or something else will execute this queue and process this information. So check uh, if you're working with SNS queues or Redis queues or something else. Uh, please also check about these dead queues, dead letter queues stuff. And of course, use metrics like logging metrics, CloudWatch metrics. Uh, maybe you use some external service like Datadogs or something else, which also provide the way to like, put some information to it. In these cases, better uh, put as more, in as more information as possible. Of course, thinking about security too, if it's user information. But it's provide you more understand it what's going on. Why, for example, some Lambda stuck or do some on like consume too much memory, of course, or for example, some fall by timeout because Lambda have this timeout stuff. You can say like, for example, Lambda can execute only one minute. 
And if you get some timeout stuff, it's very hard to debug to understand what is going on, why it's executed more than one minute. In this case, it's better to provide more metrics to understand what is going on. So that's all, guys. Thank you. Moments, we have time for questions. Oksana, help me. Just raise your hand, say your name. Oh, I see the first hand over there, one second. Michal, was the first. Hi. Um, so maybe not a question, but a comment regarding the um, cheap lambda that can uh, resize your images. Um, so a story of my of my friend actually. He created a, created a lambda function that was uh, resizing an image that was triggered by an S3 event. So. Um, the lambda resized an image, put it into a S3 bucket that triggered an S3 event, which <laughs> triggered the lambda function. Yes. And I think he realized after half an hour or something like that, and the bill was $7,000. <laughs> so guys, get over. Yes. OK, yeah. thanks for the story. Yeah, so yeah, history, I, I hope everybody heard about this. Like, uh, person create lambda function, which execute an event from S3 bucket, and they put the same image in the same S3 bucket, so, and they create event like put new object, and new object put, again call lambda function, it's again resize and put uh, the same object, and this continue till big amount, like 7,000? 7,000 uh, dollars an account, so yeah. Uh, but, but in this case, it's a good approach, like put these images into separate bucket, which not triggered by some lambda function. Or another way, like somebody used the skip approach, like you check what is going on in these records, what's exactly information. And if, for example, it's the same event and for a resized image, in this case, you just skip. But for me, better like put in separate bucket, like you will be safe in this case. Okay, do you have more questions? Uh, uh, for instance, if we uh, have like uh, all, all the ins infrastructure uh, built upon those uh, AWS lambdas, and uh, well, for example, uh, this resizing images uh, was happened like w once in a blue moon, so <laughs> that was fine, right? Yes. Uh, but suddenly, after a year or two, our um, like business grew, uh, grew, and uh, we uh, got a, a lot of those, those lambda calls. Uh, what then? How um, how hard would it be from from your experience to uh, switch to like own ser uh, server? Uh, in most cases, it's very simple because, like in these examples. Let me show you. One moment. Yes, so let's go in our Ruby code. Nope, not Ruby. Like, yeah. As you can see, we have this, this code. It's special code for uh, handle event for Lambda. But in this place, it uses this resizer. We call this, for example, resizer. And this is part of the code. It's just separate. Ruby class, function, everything else. And this was like extracted from separate process on Sidekick, which exactly doing the same job. So if you need, we need go back, it's exactly the same code, like we just switch and that's all. So in most cases, you just need to write uh, something like this on the this part, which will handle this event and do some job with this event. So in most cases, from our experience, it's very simple if you try to reuse the same code base, the same business logic. Mostly when we work with Lambda, it's like you have already working application and you see like this part of job or should be extracted. Like sometimes it's even like I feel it's microservice but still not microservice. In these cases, you just take the same part of code, extract this into Lambda function and it starts working. But if you see like something goes wrong, you get 7,000 paycheck. In these cases, you just shut down your Lambda function and continue with your stuff. This is how we do. But uh, for example, in our approaches, if we start with Lambda, mostly it's very simple stuff, like we need to renew certificates, we need to do some very simple job, 
uh, like, I don't know, or for example, uh, like as you see about static websites. We need some middleware, we should do something additional stuff because before we cannot even do this. It's like additional approach. But for already existing project, it's just like, okay, guys and girls, looks like we can just extract this and even maybe we don't need server for this. Like before we have separate worker servers and this is only one single worker which do some job like go there and upload images or do. So we just extract and shut down our servers. But only in the case if we're sure like cost for this service will be bigger than for Lambda. So you should always calculate this stuff. That's why for example as I said uh, it's not very good idea provide this like public, uh, public access to your customers because mostly you cannot control your customers. If they want, we would, they for example go into your profile page and we upload, 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 and again upload the same avatar, and you will pay for each lambda invocation. So better use it for some, for example, for us right now it's internal usage. Like we understand it's controllable because it's we control this execution. In these cases, we know how much we can pay for this. Thanks. And uh, well, uh, maybe just in addition. Uh, so, uh, is it possible, as I understood, to uh, like uh, use uh, two uh, approaches simultaneously during yes. those transitions? Yes, we are exactly yeah. doing right now this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Volodymyr. We have another question. I think, yeah. And, uh, D oh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, do you track uh, for how long your lambda runs? Uh, sorry again. Uh, do you track for how long your Lambda runs? Uh, yes, of course. And uh, how you do that? Uh, as I said, we have some metric agents. We use, like, in some places we have Datadog, and Datadog provides you, like, custom metrics. You can put custom metrics. Also, we, in some places, use um, Stack Driver, Google Stack Driver. It's inside Google Cloud, exists this monitoring solution. Uh, it's like free for Google Cloud itself, but also you can use it for external stuff. And we also track this execution. Uh, so in these cases, we understand how long this inch function runs. Also, we write like traces. Like for example, we start executing, we write something what's going on inside these functions. Uh, also, by the way, in Amazon exists such stuff called X X-ray. It's separate stuff like which provide you stack what is going on with your function. For example, if it's stuck or doing something very strange, you can go into X-Ray, sw switch it on, of course, and see what's going on in your Lambda stuff. But mostly yeah, it's monitoring solution, like we post monitoring metrics, create dashboards, cr cr create rules, triggers, which will notify us, for example, if some Lambda execution will go up or do something strange. And also sometimes we provide uh, in CloudWatch, it also like provide these logs, monitorings, and we create these triggers, for example, if uh, some Lambda start to time out. Because by default in Lambda you can provide maximum interval in the time, how long can execute Lambda function. And if no, it will just stop it and raise error. In these cases you can create in CloudWatch events, like please notify me if start time out some functions. So it's another solution. The last, the last question. Hey, thank you for talking. Uh, I have questions. Uh, do you have experience with uh, RDS? Because I know like, like uh, Lambda uh, doesn't work with RDS and uh, uh, how you uh, can solve the problem with RDS? Because RDS uh, spin up uh, with VPC, uh, so Lambda doesn't work. Uh, like I Lambda work right now with RDS, so you can do this. Uh, with uh, PostgreSQL, because I yes. know with Aurora, yes. Yes, and with PostgreSQL. Uh, right nice. now, Lambda provide, right now, current in, in AWS Lambda, it also have custom security groups. Uh -huh. So you can attach security groups to Lambda while it execution. And of course, you can whitelist your RDS inside the security group, and it will have access to RDS. But in these cases, your Lambda should be executed in VPC, as I said. No, like, internet, if you will try to go somewhere, only to RDS. But my proposal, like, very costly operation in Lambda is connections. Like, because it's starting up, and while it's going on to do some connections, you spend maybe 
100, 200 milliseconds, and it's still pricing for you for each connection to RDS. So mostly we try to use uh, Lambda function like it's transformation layer, not transportation layer, ray, layer. Like if you need transport one stuff to another place or something, something like this, we better to use some, some ETL or another approaches. Lambda, um, like right now, we doesn't see it's very good approach. If you need to transform something like images or something else or like some data and do some transformation in this data, Lambda is pretty good. But if you need to connect to some external resources, like you will pay for this time while it only connecting, not doing some, nothing. So it's possible, it works, uh, but we measured this several times and decided it's like, no, we will not pay for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys all. I see a huge Im demand in our audience to continue talking with Alexei. He will be here until I hope the latest evening, until night. So please don't be shy. Come and get Alexei after and during the break. Sure. And I personally, Alexei, want to say thank you. And uh, as soon as you've been a, um, a speaker, I don't know how many times, have you counted, like four maybe, or five? In the PIVARC, maybe you have uh, each and every T-shirt. I think you have uh, to make another gold edition for you. But still, you don't have a very special thing from us. One second. Winter is coming. Ooh. <laughs> I hope the size works for you. <laughs> Let's say thanks. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you.